This is Pastor Rick Lauterbach, pastor for Walnut Grove Baptist Church. And tonight we're going to talk about the ministry of one brother to another. Now, I'm, I'm basing this on a, on a chapter from Paul's letter to the church of Corinth, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, and in that letter, we have a strange occurrence. We, we have, ultimately, Paul is talking to a, a people that uh, are being offended. Uh, they're being offended by someone who's eating meat from an idol that they used to go to, from an altar where they used to worship false gods. Well, that has some play into how you and I are to minister to one another today. So what I want to do first is read the text. You'll see it's written over here in my handwriting. Those of you that can read it, well, you've, you've done something. But let me read this to you. It says, now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. That's an important point, by the way. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods, that small g, in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, again, small g, small l, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you, who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged? And if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brother and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes your brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Now that's an important chapter. That, that, that's an important chapter in the, in, the, in the Word of God. And it's important for us to take it in the, in the mind and understand what it means. Paul takes something that, that is normal in that day. There were temples all over the place. There, there are idols everywhere. Today there are idols everywhere. People think about it as being something that the ancient man did. And yet we have idols too. They're all over the place. John Calvin tells us that the, the human heart is an idol factory. That is, we make things to worship. Now, there's only one thing that is to be worshipped, and he can't be made. He's the unmade creator. He's the, the only God that is. <clears throat> in Paul's day, as in our day, there are many gods, as in the small g gods. But we know there is really only one God, as affirmed in that passage, when it says, there is no God but one. For although there are many so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. That's, the, that's a biblical understanding. There's only one God. There's only one, one Lord and Savior, and he's the Lord Jesus Christ. What I am affirming is the biblical perspective, that there is only one God, and there never has been or ever will be, any other gods. There are no gods before me. There are none after me, says God himself in the Old Testament. The God of the Bible being the triune creator of all things, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God. That's the God that we worship. That's the only God that is. That's the God with which we have to do, if you will. Paul is recognizing there are, in fact, false gods whom he says here are nothing, and later in that same letter declares them to be demonically empowered. And it's funny that he says that. What he's saying in this chapter, chapter 8, is he's saying there's really nothing there. In the sense there's no God there. There's, there, there's, there's no deity behind it. But then he does say that false worship, false gods are the product of demonic power, empowering through, through the, the evil, if you will. 
They're not real gods. There's no contrary to God. There's, there's no yin and yang. There, there's, only, there's only Yahweh. There's only the, the triune God of the Bible. There, there's no false gods. There's not this God for here, that God for there, and you can choose this God or that God. It's not a catalog. It's not a buffet. It's none of that business. There's the God of the Bible. He's the only one that is. And everything else is a false God. Now, when I say that, I, I don't mean to be demeaning to anybody. But the biblical truth is there is but one God. And that one God calls us not only to a, a, a faith in Christ, but following our, our subsequent faith in Christ, a love for one another that Jesus says the world would know us by. That it, the world would know us by the love we have for each other, from one brother to another. <clears throat> Paul's recognizing there are, in fact, those false gods. His point is that there are beings who pretend to be God, and, and people in error worship them. That's true. There are devils, if you will. Now, I don't want to get run down that road too far, but what I want to say is, is if there's one true God, and there are other gods being made up, it's sometimes the imagination of men because they'd rather worship this God made after their own image. A bit of a Genesis done backwards. And, and, and then there's the other, that there's demonic motivation behind it. The devil doesn't care what you worship as long as you don't worship God truly. He's, he's fine to have you be a very religious person, just so long as you don't align yourself with the God of the Bible who makes himself known through Jesus Christ. That he'll have none of. <clears throat> All worship that does not orient itself to and only to the God revealed in the Bible is demonic. That's not just my opinion, but the position of the scriptures from the beginning. My point today is not to be bogged down with the idea of false worship and false gods. I want instead to concentrate on what I'm calling the ministry of one brother to another. It's important that only God is worshipped. But it's also just important, if I am truly a worshiper of God, that as a worshiper of God, I have brothers and sisters in Christ and as such, I'm to treat them as though they have great value. And that if I love Christ and don't love my brother, then I'm doing it wrong. And, and, and that when I love Christ really, I love my brother and sister, even sometimes when they're in pain. Especially then. If you'll remember, God loves the unlovely. So then you and I must as well. Paul sets forth a scenario that sounds a lot like today. One brother is offended that his Christian brother eats meat offered upon the altar of a false god that he's been delivered from. The similarities of people to today who, after coming to a saving relationship to Jesus and are offended because this thing now done by the guy he attends church with used to be his idol is a very direct relationship. In other words, there are things out there that people worship that's not God. They spend their time, they ascribe greatest worth to this thing. They say, this is my God. This, this is where I spend my life. This, money is my pursuit. Uh, things are my pursuit. Those are your gods. What a man's God is defines him. If your God is the God of the Bible, then you're defined by that. And as defined by that, when you begin to live your life for Christ, according to this chapter of Scripture and the whole rest of the Bible, we're to live our life in a very particular way. And in fact, we're to live our life in such a way that resigned to honor Christ, if I must give away some of my liberty to strengthen a weaker brother, I'll do so. And willingly. I'll do so for the greater good of Christ, for the good of my brother. In this case, Paul identifies him as, as the weaker brother. In fact, Paul says, I'm willing to give up meat. I'm willing to stop eating meat altogether. Now, I have to admit, that gives me a bit of a pause. But I think I'd be willing. I think we should all be willing, be willing to, to do it. And not just, not just in the way of talking about it, but, but about really doing it. Now, what I want to show you is some of the things I have marked out here. Paul talks about knowledge, but then he says, but love builds up. Knowledge puffs up. When you get a swelled head, it's good for nothing. But a swelled heart, it builds up stuff. It makes things. And then he says, as you'll see underlined, it says an idol has no real existence, has no real life in it. False gods don't really have any power. And yet people will, will kill other persons for the worship of these false gods. 
He says there is no God but one. That's just a biblical affirmation of the fact that, there, that God alone is God and there are none like him. There will be none after him. But I, where I really want to pay attention is right down here where it says in verse 9, but take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block. If my liberty gets in the way of my brother, will I not set that aside? What about my responsibility? You and I are forever running to our liberties and our freedoms. What about our responsibility? Before Christ, we have a responsibility to love one another in such a way the world sees it. Do they see us giving up our liberties one for another? Or do they instead see us pressing our, 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 our liberties and saying, no, you must, you must, you must let me have my way. And if you won't do it this way, well, then we can no longer fellowship. Well, that's a sad statement, really. And I've seen brothers and sisters disfellowship one another over insignificant things, pressing their liberty and not their responsibility. It's a sad thing, really. <clears throat> so we're to take care that this right of yours does not become a stumbling block. Paul says it actually is a right. It, it, it's something that's not wrong for him to do. It's, it, it's his, in Christ he has liberty to eat this meat offered on an idol because the idol is nothing and if the meat is cheaper, just go get the meat, man. But don't eat it over at Bob's house because Bob is offended because he used to worship down there at that altar and, and, it, and, and it, it, it pricks his conscience and you don't want to be part of that. Mo moving down to some of the other things I have underlined and boxed in here. And so by your knowledge... This weak person is destroyed. I believe we're put into this world to be a, an avenue for, for love, for blessing. We're to bring good and not evil. According to this, Paul says, and by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed. In fact, not just any weak person, the brother for whom Christ died. You're united by the blood of Christ. You're united by your faith in Jesus. You're united to the Savior. And being in union with Christ, you're in union with your brother. And yet, are some of us willing to crush our brother and still say, I have liberty in Christ and destroy him? It's not Christ-like at all. We're to bring good into this world and not evil. And then sometimes, in the exchange, we receive evil and return good. That's the, that's the Christ-like way. That, 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 that's the Christ-honoring way. That, that, that's the Christian way. And it, and it identifies this man as a brother for whom Christ died. Therefore, he has great value in the eyes of your Savior. So therefore, he has great value in your eyes. Sinning against your brother and wounding their conscience when it is weak. You sin against Christ. If I purposely press my liberties, my rights, and forget my responsibilities, and I sin against my brother, I am probably, if not almost, almost entirely, sinning against Christ. Because all sin is first and foremost, according to Psalm 51, first and foremost against God. David, who kills a man and has him murdered, says that his sin is only against God. What he means is chiefly, your eye is still dead. But God has sinned against the most great. So when you sin against your brother, you sin against your God. You sin against your Savior. We're to be careful how we treat our brothers and sisters in Christ. Number one, because Christ has died for them. Number two, because the testimony before the world is to be that we have love one for another. <clears throat> and then there's that thing at the end. The one that stabs me in my own conscience. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble... I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. See, you and I are to help our brothers up, not put them down, not, 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 not trip them, not, stum not be a stumbling block to them, but instead raise them up. Remember, love builds up. It doesn't tear down. Now, I have to give a little bit of a caveat here, because sometimes this weaker brother continues to press this. 30 years down the road, he says, I used to worship down there. Time to get over it. Time to stop being the weaker brother. Sometimes the weaker brother presses his liberties. He presses his liberty. I have the right to be offended. No, you don't. 
Paul says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. Now I speak as a man. Some of us need to stop acting like babies and grow up in Christ. And grow up in Christ in, in the way that we, we, we will, are willing to sacrifice our liberty for the good of our brother. And the other brother needs to sacrifice his overly tender conscience so that he's, he's no longer a stone about the neck of his brother and sister in Christ. In the end, what this is really aimed at is, is the whole body of Christ. This whole chapter, 1 Corinthians 8, is, is aimed at the follower of Jesus saying, your life is not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, live differently. Don't live like the pagans. You have no right to that life anymore. It's gone. It's over. It's done. That being said, I hope that you're, you're convicted by this text of, of Scripture. It's 1 Corinthians 8, the ministry of one brother to another. Every one of you has a ministry to perform. You're to strengthen Christ in him. You're to be a place of strength in his life. You're to be a blessing to him. Now that's a, that's a real high calling. And it's beyond your ability apart from the indwelling of the Spirit. But through the power of the Spirit, we like Paul can say, I have labored harder than all of you, yet through the power of the Spirit. Well, let me leave that there and I'm going to ask you to, to bow your head and pray with me and then we're going to close off at that. Father, we pray, God, your blessing upon your people. Help us, Lord, that when we have differing opinions, when we're on other sides, that we remember, that's my brother in Christ. Jesus died for him. And so I, I then ought to be willing to do exactly that. So help us, Lord, to be a strengthening to one another, a blessing to one another, and a blessing to, to you as you see us loving one another as the world cannot. We ask, Lord, your blessings and mercy upon us as your people. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.